going to talk about the Guazio. We basically launched product just yesterday, officially. Uh, still serving the beta level with tier one customers mainly, but we're going to expand to uh, broader reach. And uh, I'm also going to speak about the cloud native applications, how they should be designed, uh, and all the aspects of data within cloud native applications. So, uh, you know, just sort of to start, what we do see is uh, sort of the transformation today from traditional apps that are more uh, monolithic, you know, built around traditional RDBMSs, uh, SAN, virtual machines, into what uh, many people refer to as this sort of uh, digital transformation. And uh, as part of it, in order to build this kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, which fits this uh, model of uh, distributed application that are globally connected, uh, you, you tend to use different tools, not sort of the legacy ones that you use, like you know, Oracle or MySQL, but in many cases you use NoSQL solutions, you know, things like Cassandra or MongoDB. Uh, you may use analytic tools because you have so many feeds of uh, logs and events that you want to al analyze, so potentially things like Spark and Hadoop. And then you build applications that are more connected, where clients are not necessarily terminals, but could be whether it's mobile devices or apps or, or anything else. And uh, and uh, one of the ways to build things that are very elastic is basically uh, building what is referred to as cloud native applications. And, and really Docker is, uh, is one of the ways to implement the cloud native applications. You can still use uh, VMs for that, but uh, container is a better, uh, better solution for that. And some people tend to confuse uh, Docker and microservices with virtual machines. It's not the same thing. And we're going to, to speak about why it's not the same thing. Uh, because Docker is really more about an application container and VM is more of a virtual infrastructure. So VM has virtual NICs and virtual disks, so it's pretty much like the physical thing, just virtualized. Uh, where in containers you don't really want to care about infrastructure anymore. You want to build, you want to make, and, and then sort of launch an application, and that uh, brings differences. Uh, one of the sort of the, the idea around building cloud native applications is uh, uh, going through what is referred to as the 12 uh, factor uh, rules and then sort of the golden standards of how to build applications which are more distributed, more elastic and more fault tolerant. So the general idea about uh, cloud native is that uh, things will always break. So if we run a, a service, there is a good chance that uh, if I have hundreds of, of services, it will break. So what uh, many cloud providers actually do, they break them on purpose. Because they have things that go and break services and, and see that they actually keep yes. working. Sorry. Yes. And, uh, and those are uh, the different rules around it is, you know, basically, uh, you don't want to create state in the dark containers. You want to create code and uh, do it in, in Git or something like that. And then just when you want to build your container, just build it. You want, you don't want to create images like in traditional VMs and then manage all those uh, images and, and all the configurations and logs within those images. That's also why that everything that is sort of persistent in, in a container needs to be externalized. So in traditional VMs, we have configuration files. We have uh, log files that are part of the state. We have uh, data that is stored as part of the, uh, the VM itself. And then we have all this complexity about uh, backing up VMs and creating <coughs> snapshots for VMs and, and all this sort of a huge mess and we start I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term cattle and pets. Basically, we treat, in VMs, we treat them like, uh, like pets. We always sort of have to deal with them and, and fix them. And if we have hundreds of instances doing the same thing, we don't really want to treat it as, as uh, pets. We want to treat them as, as cattle. So uh, those are some of the guidelines. Basically, we need to externalize all the states. So instead of uh, preserving a log file within the container, what we do, we use a log stream. And these are one, some, one of the those uh, rules and basically use something whether it's elastic storage or something else you just throw everything out because think about you know a container that may leave for only a few seconds and then goes away and you have a bug how are you going to debug this uh, thing if the, the <coughs> file sort of resides in this uh, uh, container just went away so you do want to have another external tool for for managing those you want to externalize any state uh, from the configuration so even Using a file system with the Docker and container is sort of a violation of the 12 rules because uh, file systems are not necessarily atomic. When you write to a file system, there's still a file system cache, there's still file handles. If this uh, container fails, 
and reboots again, it doesn't necessarily go back to the same situation. And this is why, in many cases, when you build a, a real cloud application that scales, you use things that are more atomic by nature, like object storage and no SQL database. So basically, when you do the update into something that when you submit the transaction, when you get the acknowledgement, you know that it's sort of a done uh, thing. So if that container just fades away and relaunches again, uh, you don't have a, a problem. You also want to create things that are elastic. So if you start to put things in the container, and this container has state, you cannot really create elasticity and bring more instances to do the same thing. So, so those, those are some of the guidance around uh, building those applications. And basically, all those things relate to one thing, is that you cannot really treat the data portion of a cloud-native application like you used to do. You not just say, okay, I'm going to take a volume or a lot or some of those things that come from sort of the storage space, mount it and use it for my Docker containers. You need to start thinking about this uh, a bit differently. So in the traditional world, we had a uh, virtual machine and each virtual machine had a virtual disk. And uh, why did we have those virtual disks? Because those were the places where we put all the log files and configuration files and application data. We said it's sort of a violation. We don't want to do that anymore because those uh, sort of pets need to have backups and snapshots and you know versioning and, and all this uh, mess <coughs> doesn't allow us to really create elastic application. So basically, what we want to move into is things that are more cloud native types of, of data patterns, uh, and those needs to be shared because if you're looking at a virtual uh, disk, it's not a shared thing. You can't have many different VMs accessing the same virtual disk because then you're going to get data corruption. Something that you can share is like object storage, like an S3 uh, bucket, everyone can share that. Everyone can read the same objects, everyone can write the same objects. So, and uh, same for NoSQL solutions like a MongoDB. You have the passwords, go to MongoDB and read and write uh, some records. So uh, the idea is in cloud native application, you're moving from a notion of traditional storage, which is more Know, files and block uh, operations into things that are more sort of data objects in different forms. And there are different forms like log streams and time series streams and that's sort of some of the problem that we're, we're uh, solving and we'll talk, we'll talk about it. Uh, so everyone says Docker is really easy and microservices is really easy. So it is really easy to launch a container but there is a small challenge. We need to build a lot of infrastructure for us to build those simple containers. So we have to have the image repository and we have to have some message queues because the right way to communicate between microservices is not to send uh, just an RPC, it's going through a message queue, a durable message queue. So if my container got sort of crashed, uh, the message will still arrive to an alternate container that will process the same uh, request. So that's something that you need to set up. So whether it's a RabbitMQ or a Kafka or something like that, that is a form of storage that comes with this and infrastructure. And another thing is you need to have a sort of a cache because uh, many transactions, when you want to create elasticity on the application, you want to store, for example, a session cookie or something like that in an elastic uh, kind of cache. So you use a Redis. That's something you need to install. And say for NoSQL, whether it would be a Mongo or a Cassandra or any one of those uh, uh, packages, we, we mentioned logs, that you want to stream logs into a, a log stream. Um, statistics, so again, it could be Elasticsearch, could be any, anything else, like Grafana, Graphite, whatever. And in some cases, you try to avoid that, but in some cases you want to have shared volume, because if you're running sort of stateful applications, it does need to have some sort of file access. Uh, so uh, it does require a lot of uh, work. So. Again, how do we assemble a cloud-native application? So basically, a cloud-native application, like any application, may comprise of tiers. So I may have a load balancer that balances uh, across the, the traffic into uh, different API services. And those API services are traffic coming from my mobile devices or desktop applications. And those API services will sort of scan the content and, and based on what the request is, may forward it to different uh, backend services. Uh, on the backend, I may have uh, different services, uh, mainly two types of services, the ones that are more stateless and the ones that are more stateful, but I could have many, many of those. 
each one of the services have many instances. And if you're familiar with Mesos or Kubernetes or some of those uh, packages, and we'll hear about Gunify in a minute, is uh, basically you can just dial up and down the number of instances. And if you uh, decouple the state from the instance, it is, uh, it is going to scale. And some of those practices in cloud native applications always put the configuration in sort of the command line in the environment variables don't really put them inside the, the image, this is one of the ways to uh, make them stateless and elastic. Now in addition to, uh, to those things, we still need uh, to put some data. If it is a stateful service, so we may sort of mount on top of a file system volume. And uh, that's something we should try to avoid, again, because of all the issues around uh, volumes that are not totally uh, stateless. And uh, the rest of the data, for a thing that are more stateless uh, would run in different types of, uh, of buckets. And those buckets could be you know, things that are faster, things that are sort of in between, and things that are uh, slower and cheaper. And that's sort of the differentiation between the different products in this type. So, you know, after all, uh, whether it's uh, S3 or Redis or a key value, they serve very similar APIs. Uh, maybe some of them have also ability to run some procedures and and have a bit more insight into the data, but in, in essence, they provide very similar uh, notions. Now, in addition to basically the data of sort of the application, you also have the sort of the operational uh, data uh, for diagnostic and monitoring. So these will be sort of the long streams, live series uh, streams where you sort of want to manage uh, your application uh, lifecycle, and those logs may actually run against some analytic tools that want to go and anal analyze them, uh, whether it's to generate more application insights, what your uh, users are doing, uh, where they're coming from, etc., or maybe just for diagnostic of your application to monitor the health of your application. And here we see things like Elasticsearch and Spark and <coughs> others in this category. Uh, so some, some people say, okay, you know what, the solution to the problem, let's sort of stick to the old guns. And uh, one way is to uh, basically uh, build those uh, backend services, not the application itself, uh, by just taking physical servers. Uh, think about like Cassandra or MongoDB server. Uh, just uh, you don't need any sort of uh, SAN to, to use it because they already have the clustering. It's actually not a good idea to use uh, backend SAN uh, because the application typically do the clustering. So if you do clustering on the application level and clustering on the underlying layer, it's sort of you missed the, the point, you wasted a lot of energy, and you created, uh, in many of the, those databases, they, they tend to try and know how the disk is operating. If you think about Cassandra, it does try to create sequential workloads or HDFS. And if you're putting an underlying uh, hyperconverged or something like that underneath, the pattern that the application thinks is sequential happens to now be random because the actual distribution of the data across the disk may be scattered around because there are different applications writing to the same disk. So in many cases, and there are benchmarks I won't show them here, is that this case running some of those middleware on a hyper-converged or a sort of a virtualized storage layer uh, <coughs> reduces the performance by at least a factor of two. And there are benchmarks in, in different frameworks on that. So. Uh, Physical uh, deployment of storage is uh, sort of what was originally what everyone used. It does have some uh, limitation because you have tight coupling between computers and storage. If you need to have more storage, you just need to buy another server. Uh, it is typically a slower stack because if you're, you're buying uh, more uh, real storage and they have caches and not all that caches and, and tiering logic and some other things that make them faster, typically uh, those stacks are slower. And it's harder to manage where everything is sort of physical infrastructure. Uh, the use of uh, some of those hyperconverged or vSAN or even like the Nutanix of the world is also limiting because it's pretty inefficient. You can see that basically we do clustering in three different layers of the stack, and, and much of it is redundant. Uh, it is eventually very slow performance because of those things I mentioned that the application think it's running in a certain pattern to the disk, but eventually it's being uh, sort of a scramble. And uh, a lot of excessive network and, and high traffic. So uh, one solution is going to, to Amazon, the real cloud native is you know, 
they started in those companies. And uh, Amazon will be very nice to you. They'll offer you a service for any need and every pain. And, and this is just a partial example because since this uh, slide, they actually added more services, uh, like EFS and others. And, and they'll tell you that basically for every combination of data model or data, data pattern and data temperature, so to speak, they'll have a different service for you. And for every different service, they'll even have a unique API for you. So you, you, you can actually do something in your life and go to different APIs instead of having one API for multiple services. Even the ones that have this serve exactly the same pattern will have different APIs. And, and suddenly you, uh, you decide that you need more performance because you need to change your application because you need to change the new API that happened to be a solution that either going to a new thing and saying, go, we need another solution and go build it and not necessarily trying to consolidate uh, the APIs. And uh, it also serves their, their need because they're sort of locking you in into uh, using more APIs. It will be harder to move to Google or to Azure or anyone else. So, sir, what are you really uh, looking for as a solution is uh, what if I can just have, let's call them data containers, as a way to contain all the data for my business application, sort of one uh, logical uh, construct, uh, and that data container can store any type of data in every speed, basically I can store objects that could be either fast or slow depending on my, my pattern, I don't want to change the API. And maybe I can store all the different structures that an application require, whether they're streams or objects or, or tables, in the same bucket, and I want to just zip them and ship them to a different location and open them and start working, and still basically zipping all those different stacks and, and making sure they're in a consistent fashion <coughs> in a different place. It's much harder. Uh, so basically, this is what we're doing. Yeah. So uh, what it was it does is uh, we're coming from a, a a lot of uh, background in, in infrastructure and applications, and we said let's sort of merge uh, this knowledge. Uh, so we build a very high performance software stack to either fit into an appliance for people looking for simplicity or to provide it as a software. And uh, for each one of those stacks, it sits in a one or two U uh, server appliance, and they can produce about 2.5 million uh, database operations per second. And we'll sort of compare between about Cassandra, that's 60,000. That's about almost 100 or 30 times faster uh, than those. Uh, and, uh, and also you could see other matrix in terms of latency, throughput, IOS, any matrix will sort of uh, way faster. And also the way it's designed, it's designed to scale. So it's very much like a hyperscale architecture built inside Facebook and inside Amazon that the server, instead of having servers with only 12 drives, like the common case, and there you sort of waste a lot of CPUs and memory, uh, every server basically connects to up to 300 drives. So the balance between sort of the cost of storage and cost of the computation is sort of most of the cost of the solution is actually the actual spindles, the actual drives, and not the rest of the... So that's uh, basically what we do. What we also do is we, we de decouple the API layer from the sort of engine layer, and then we can basically support any API. So we could provide existing APIs. We support all the Amazon APIs. We support S3 and Kinesis and DynamoDB. Uh, we support uh, Spark, HDFS, just uh, Docker volumes for file uh, and Kafka for streaming. And the interesting thing, they all fit into the same thing. So you could actually uh, write a streaming in Kafka and read it in a Kinesis or read it as a natural object. This obviously goes into the same uh, so, sort of uh, database. And how did we do this magic is, uh, let's think about all those different types of data. And they, basically what they have is different organization and different indexing methods. Okay. So if I'm thinking about a file, my index is basically directory name. And then the organization of the data has very simple metadata like uh, you know, modify time, UID, GID. And then I have a bunch of extent storing the data. Now if I'm working on a database that's sort of more of a fixed structure of columns, the index is sort of the path or the, the key, and sort of you know, documents are a little more sophisticated. So we said, why can't we sort of normalize all of that into one data model? Okay. So basically, all those keys, so basically I have two types of keys, one are which are sequential, one which is random. In many of those different packages, that's one of the major differences. So why want to have both? Let's put two keys on every, on every object. So 
may have sequential and and random. So if I'm trying to fetch an individual object by and I have the full path of the object, I'm basically doing a hash and fetching it within a, a few microseconds. If I need to uh, scan for doing like an LS operation or a where clause or something like that, I need to go in and do a article scanning and go over a tree. So basically we're, we just have two uh, constructs for, for indexing going into the same thing and that buys us uh, a lot of nice features. Um, and we, we also have very flexible structure, being more like a very dense type of JSON structure or a structure uh, that could be nested. And this is how you can describe this game, any one of those things in a very condensed and compressed. Uh, it's not really JSON, it's just sort of the model. It's actually encoded in a very uh, efficient byte, uh, byte, me byte mechanisms with uh, dictionaries and all that in order to uh, make it very high performance uh, search uh, over that uh, data. So this is how we achieve basically a multi-model, that's sort of the term now you insert, a multi-model storage that stores basically any type of data and can translate from any model to any other model. Um, and one of the challenges with the existing stack and, uh, uh, is that you basically have so many layers. Think about that. Uh, So you have your storage stack, your block storage stack, and, and then you have a file system. Every fi time a file system <coughs> wants to write something, it actually does few access to the block layer. It needs to write to the file system, it writes to the sector, and, and all that. And it's all serialized because you have to wait until those things happen and it moves to the next transaction. And when you, you have a database, it needs to write a few times to the file system. Uh, one for journaling, one for redo, write and log, content, you know, table, indexes, all that. Few writes for every database transaction. And then your API typically does few database transactions for every API call. So what you got is sort of a huge amplification from the minute you send an API call uh, until you sort of got to the actual disk. And that mean that is the reason why on MySQL you won't get more than a few tens of thousands of transactions or Cassandra or any of those things. So what we did, we sort of said, let's uh, change it. Let's sort of mesh together all those layers into one extremely high performance stack and use the latest uh, NVMe, you know, high performance flash technologies and all the memory technologies to avoid a lot of the chatter within the stack. And that is really why we can do things which uh, many customers tell us, ah, I don't believe it. it's impossible until they sort of see the actual demo. Uh, we show uh, two. 2.5 million file operations per second uh, on a single server. <coughs> the fastest file system in the world right now, all flash, all that, is 160,000 transactions per second. So we're more than 10 times faster than the fastest thing. And, and the same thing is also a database. It's not just a file system. You can actually do also 2 million uh, database requests per second. And the fastest, again, database, uh, if you think about Cassandra, that's 60. It's way faster than anything else because of, of this transition of the stack, this meshing everything together to one uh, normalized uh, structure. And these are just some of the statistics. Again, uh, we also provide DynamoDB and Kinesis. And the nice thing is that uh, our S3 does 800,000 S3 operations per second, and Amazon does only about 10,000 or maybe 15,000. So it's almost uh, 60 times faster than Amazon implementation of S3. Uh, if you're looking at DynamoDB, Amazon does about 20,000 transactions and then you're starting to get errors and uh, you, know, you lose uh, messages and all those uh, queries, we can do 2 million operations. So it's about uh, 100 times. A very interesting thing is that Amazon provides an in-memory uh, database technology based on Redis, their uh, elastic uh, cache, and they do about 600,000 transactions per second on elastic cache. We actually faster than that. But the interesting point is that Elastic Cash costs you $11 per gig per month. And our solution costs about three cents. So it's quite a bit of a difference because we don't use memory. We use Flash, which is much uh, cheaper than using memory and all the computation. And, and all that, again, in a far lower uh, cost model because of this construct of creating extremely high density uh, infrastructure. Uh, what we also did, we took the ideas of cloud and how to manage this all as a service. So those, those things allow you to basically consume 
uh, create those data containers and, and create security policies around them and what is referred to as life cycle policies or backup policies and retention policies and, and also manage all the infrastructure more from a like, service orientation. And now how do we <coughs> couple all of this into a real application? So let's assume I want to build a real application, a real mobile application in this case. Uh, so basically I have different application patterns. So uh, from starting from the application itself, I have some static uh, content, my Angular files, my JPEGs, all that. And because we have S3, you can just go and fetch them. You don't need any API server, server uh, for those static content. Uh, same for queries, because you have uh, things like DynamoDB and, and Kinesis APIs, you can actually push messages through a Kinesis API, which is a RESTful API. Just a, you have uh, an endpoint and you send, and we'll show that in a minute, and you just send a RESTful uh, message and that goes into the system. Again, no need for API services. Uh, same for uh, uh, you know, key value uh, data. And, and key value can also be combined with time series data. So your actual uh, Angular <coughs> application that wants to show widget of graphs would actually run a query and get the widget of graph with all the time samples directly. So again, no need for server application. And because this thing has actually a firewall as the first stage, you just put some rules and who was allowed to fetch which data sets and with what operation. The only thing that actually needs to go to an API service is those more dynamic kind of uh, REST uh, requests. <coughs> and there you could have a, a Docker container or even a bunch of them that process this data. Uh, and then uh, within the microservices, you'll have API services, then you may have other backend services to do more uh, business logic, and they, they would work against the system with the different patterns of data. Uh, they can just uh, store logs through a streaming API, and they could uh, read and write data uh, through more of a key value API, and, um, and also just mount it as a Docker volume if they want. Uh, in parallel, you could have analytic tools running against exactly the same data, just consuming it again, either as files, or if you're using Spark, you could actually use it as a native data frame uh, in Spark, where all the uh, sort of query semantics actually run here. So Spark issues a query, and this query doesn't really run in, in Spark, there is something in Spark called predicate push down. It's basically telling the database underneath, please give me only those match, uh, matching rows, and, and then we only return the subset. Basically, we can accelerate Spark behavior about 100x uh, faster because we only return the relevant data uh, to Spark or to any of those analytic tools. And then eventually, you can just go and take all of that stuff and back it up as you want a logical container. Uh, any questions? Or uh, so, uh, a few lines of code to show you uh, this is actually an uh, illustration of the. DynamoDB API from uh, from uh, Amazon that we sort of uh, uh, leverage. And so uh, let's assume I want to update a, a record. And the only thing I need to do is fill up a, a very simple uh, HTTP header, you know, key, items, values, the REST command, and I have to do that. So it's very simple from the developer perspective. If I want to do a time series aggregations, one of the tricks is that uh, within DynamoDB and other databases, you can create sort of an array of counters and then just do the aggregation on the fly. You just say, you know, instead of, uh, I want to have an hourly and a minute uh, bucket, instead of creating code that aggregates all that stuff, you just, you just fill up the buckets, mm -hmm. uh, seconds, minutes, hours. And then the nice thing is that another application wants to visualize it, will just go and read this data set and visualize it. So it could be, uh, it could save a lot of computation. And if you want to run a, a big query and present the results in a dashboard, again, you just put a filter exp expression, which is like a SQL query clause, and all the results will sort of come back, and then you visualize them in your application. So, uh, and that that is just uh, I'm saying application. That application could be a Docker container that runs against those things, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a RESTful. There are also APIs that are faster than that. Okay. Uh, now, if you're too lazy to write uh, HTTP code and, uh, and use uh, some of those tools, there is even a very simplistic uh, you know, 
Yang, for example, this is a Python uh, demonstration. And if you want to open a stream to get every event that comes to the system, you basically just say open, and here's a callback, just send me a message when there is a message to process. So you can also work with abstract APIs, uh, or if you want to, for example, upload a file to the S3, you can go right, don't want to write the REST code, uh, then you can just say, here's the bucket, here's the source file, here's the destination file, let's go and upload this file. So uh, we're trying to also make life easier for the developers. <coughs> and this is a, another uh, example of how do you create sort of elastic uh, microservices. In many cases, you have you want to basically dynamically change the number of instances based on the load of, uh, of the incoming uh, stream. So uh, what you typically do, you have a, basically a bunch of shards that's nothing supported by Kafka and Kinesis and most of the message queues. And then each instance just pick up which shards it's going to, to use. So for example, I have 10 shards and I may have only uh, two instances. So basically every instance will pick up four shards and process them. What happens if my uh, instances are sort of uh, being bombarded by too many messages? I want to launch a third uh, instance and distribute, redistribute the workload across all of those. So, uh, and then basically you redivide the shards to the different uh, instances. Uh, one of the things that uh, we like about, I think it's also in Kinesis, not just in ours, is that basically when you read a message from the queue, you actually all the, all the information about how much is this message behind all the rest of the messages. So you can actually know how much are you lagging behind the rest of the queue. If you take this message and send it to sort of a broker application or sort of a monitor application, this monitor application or records or a number of bytes, if it needs to respawn, get another instance and redistribute the stream. Again, it's very easy using th those uh, patterns to create very elastic uh, application. This is a very similar, if you're familiar with the Amazon Lambda, it's a sort of event-driven uh, code. This is a very similar uh, approach, but more, more flexible. <coughs> so uh, one of the things we did at the Strata, I don't have the demo here, uh, but uh, we wanted to show how you build a, a complete end-to-end -end application. It involves sort of a lot of complexity around one, one uh, basic platform. No infrastructure that needs to be set up. Just sort of uh, create those data containers and start working with them. So what we did, we took a bunch of uh, model cars. We equipped them with the Raspberry Pis and uh, took uh, cameras and all the sensors we could buy in, uh, in Amazon. And uh, temperature sensors, distance sensors, etc. <coughs> what they do, they generate the information against the system. So the information could be of different types. Could be uh, streaming data like uh, sample data of sensors, could be video streams uh, directly from those uh, cameras of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it could be configuration basically being read as from the table through DynamoDB uh, kind of APIs, or maybe updates to the state of the car uh, basically being pushed as an update to those tables. Uh, the same uh, data could be accessed by mobile application just the same way. Uh, those can just go, if I'm a driver and I want to see my cars, I have the ideas of my cars, I can just go to the NoSQL API and grab the con context or configuration or state of those cars. Or even if I want to drive, you know, basically blink a light on the car, I would just go, so push a message into the message queue that will eventually arrive at the car. So that creates very simple application, very, very simple application using the REST kind of calls that I showed before. And uh, on the dashboard, using those where clauses and REST calls, for aggregation, you could actually do the same, and immediately, the minute that you had some update on those events, on those uh, cars, you can consume them on the dashboard. Another thing that we, we wanted to show is what happens if I want to do more sophisticated analytics, like machine learning or prediction based on the on the data that's being generated by those cars. And basically, we took Spark, and Spark sort of taps on the same tables, analyze all the content, generate predictions through machine learning algorithms and then enriches the model again. So we have the same tables basically have new columns being created to say sort of what is the projection of uh, fuel and what's, you know, uh, when do I need to change tires, etc. Okay, so this is uh, <coughs> showing this example. 
And also there is event driven code in uh, the different Docker containers showing, uh, using the same technology I showed before, that elastically I can sort of deal with uh, different triggers coming from those applications. Just launch more uh, Docker containers based on the load that is generated on the system. So this is just showing an end-to-end -end application where now I don't really need a lot of infrastructure set up. To just focus on my application building blocks and sort of that the infrastructure is being set up automatically. I could also do that in Amazon with exactly the same APIs, just in our platform it's also unified. And this really what allows you that one platform could run against Spark, could run against uh, different uh, data models and all just in one one place where all the security aspects and data maintenance aspects are just policies on that block. Who access, which tables, which data elements is just something that you set up through a very simple set of rules and you don't have to code it into the application. 